What happens when the internet is everywhere? So I'm Molly Ilbrock. I do PR and uh, marketing here at ESMT Berlin. And it is my pleasure to welcome you and to welcome Lee to Berlin today. This um, is part of our ESMT Open Lecture Series, but it's also a special event because we also um, is a part of the Berlin Science Week. And we're very excited to have all a lot of new faces here today in a series that's been going on for almost eight years. So what could be more current than the questions surrounding the ever-growing importance of the Internet of Things? I really don't know. And I do hope that Lee gives me some answers to um, what, yeah, what's my life going to look like in about 10 more years, and maybe in two years. I don't know. If you look at the commercials, I watched some TV with commercials yesterday, and it was all about the smart home. And I was like, hmm. OK, do I want it, do I not? Don't have it right now. So Lee Rainey is Director of Internet and Technology Research at the, research, the Pew Research Center based in Washington, DC. He's an expert on so many things that I'll just have to read my list. Internet and technology, smartphones and mobile technology, social media, the future of technology and work, and there was many more. I had to stop the list at that. So he's a great addition to our series. The Pew Research Center has issued more than 650 reports based on surveys concerning people's online activities and the Internet's role in their lives. In 2014, the American Sociological Association presented Lee Rainey its award for excellence in reporting on social issues. Lee Rainey graduated from Harvard University and has a master's degree in political science from Long Island University. Prior to launching the Pew Research Center's technology research, he was managing editor of US News and World Report. And for those of you who are um, Americans or uh, maybe in the university system at all, you would know the US News and World Report, especially from the university rankings. But also, I have to say, my father had a subscription my entire life. So I grew up with the US News and World Report. So today's lecture will be moderated by Isabel Skierka. She's a research at the Digital Society Institute at ESMT Berlin. And when she introduces herself later, she will tell you a little bit more about the Digital Society Institute. Before I pass on to Lee Rainey, I would like to um, thank the Pew Research Center for making this open lecture happen, and also thank our media partners, Manager Magazine, on der Tagesspiegel. So the floor is yours, Lee. Thank you. So much. Thank you. It's a v delight to be here. And this looks like a very American kind of audience to lots of different kinds of people from different kinds of places. I want to explain a little bit about the Pew Research Center because we're a special kind of place. We are, we call ourselves a fact tank, which is different from the American institution and the German institution think tanks. Think tanks are in the business of solving problems. Their scholars and experts see problems in society, and they try to come up with solutions to those problems, and then aggressively promote those solutions so that policymakers will adopt them. At the Pew Research Center, we are not about the business of problem solving. We do very strong social science research. We generate a lot of data, in my case, about the impact of technology. We do a lot of national surveys. We do now work with big data. But we don't do it for the purpose of an agenda. We are not cheerleaders for the internet. I'm not a supporter or worrier about the internet of things. Uh, we don't have policies that we're promoting about net neutrality or privacy or things like that. We are supposed to be almost like journalists. And you heard from Martha that I used to be a journalist. And in America, it's very important for journalists not to have any beliefs at all. So this is like a perfect job for me. I have no belief system that I can translate uh, into my work. But it's a very special place, and I'm, I'm delighted to be there. I have the best job in the world, as you will hear. I get to study all of these wonderful things. So the Internet of Things is a big idea. Sometimes uh, I understand in Germany now you are talking about the digitalization of life. This is kind of like the same idea. The Internet of Things is just beginning to roll through societies now. 
Um, and it's, it's meant to be something where everything is connected, just like I talked about in the title of this lecture. Literally, the things that you wear, the things that you sit in in the rooms that you're in, the transportation that you use, the environment uh, in cities and in countrysides and all over the world has data in it and connected devices in it that are feeding data to the analytics world. So a very central part of the Internet of Things is that lots of devices will be capturing lots of data about you, and it will be understood through algorithms and other kinds of analyses, sometimes without even you knowing about it. So there's a very strong dimension of the rise of the Internet of Things where uh, the world around us will be telling stories on us. And those stories will be understood sometimes by human beings and a lot of times by machines. And it's a new world where humans' relationship with machines is going to dramatically change. So there are ways in which you know, technological enthusiasts get crazy about all of these developments. There's an American consultant firm called Gartner. And they have now watched how there is a pattern to the way that communications technologies roll out in the world, and particularly how they are understood by their cultures, by the journalistic community, by the technology community, and by the policy community. And it goes in kind of an arc. And there are, at the top of the arc, at the top of that curve there, is when they are most hyped when they are most, people are most enthusiastic about their implications and about all of the great things that are going to come from these technologies, and then the technologies hardly ever live up to that original enthusiasm. So there's a collapse in the enthusiasm, and then eventually as societies learn how to embrace things and adapt them to their own needs, then there's a little bit more enthusiasm, but it's gradual. So you can see at the top of this chart, the Internet of Things last year, according to this consultant firm, was at the very peak of the enthusiasm and hype and uh, embrace of the Internet of Things even before it is coming into being in lots of people's lives, it will eventually get to that, that trough, that, that place where it's not really working the way the enthusiasts originally promised, and then, so there will be disappointment about it. But eventually, probably, the Internet of Things will catch on and rise up again. Now, here are some of the ways in which the hype seems to be playing out in the world. All of these manufacturers are making devices now with connectivity built into them. So one of the devices that is now on the market in the United States of America is a smart dog collar. And the dog collar will tell you how much food your dog eats, how quickly your dog eats food, whether the dog is consuming more calories than expending calories in exercise so the dog will gain weight, and obesity with, with pet animals in the United States is a very serious kind of problem, so this is going to help solve that. And there are whole ways that this industry now, this is about a, a, a 200 euro product just for your dog to see whether your dog's going to get fat or not, okay? Then there is the smart hairbrush. This is about 170 euros, $200, and it's a hairbrush that comes with sensors in it that can tell how fast you're stroking your hair. It has gyroscopes in it to see whether you're pulling your hair down too fast and doing damage to your hair. It has other kinds of sensors into it to adjust the brush tension in case your hair is a lot more damp or wet than other things. Now, hairbrushes in the United States probably cost three or four dollars. This is 170 euros, 200 dollars. And my favorite example of the craziness that is now attaching to the internet is toilet paper and toilet paper dispensers. These are dispensers that will warn you that your toilet paper is running low and you need to get more of it. And there are, this company now is thinking about putting sensors in the toilet paper itself just to tell if everything's going okay in that part of your life. Now, I don't know about you, but I think this is the, this is the sign that 
cultures are going crazy when they start doing uh, things like this. But so that's why the Internet of Things is at the sort of peak of hype. And there are any number of business organizations and consultancies that are predicting that the Internet of Things will take over the business world. These are lots of statistics that I have amassed from a variety of consultancies and other kinds of recommendations. But it talks about 60% of manufacturers will use analytics, that all the data that are fed. One of the things in that hairbrush um, was that there was going to be an app on your smartphone to give you uh, a running uh, set of uh, calculations about how well your hair was doing. Uh, for some reason, I'm not particularly worried about that. Um, but there are ways in which all of these analytics now get fed into apps and, and other kinds of things. Uh, there's an economics firm that talked about um, 75.4 billion worth of connections by 2025. Now, some of this uh, is talking about connected devices that are very small. One of the elements of the Internet of Things is called smart dust. And there are ways in which, you know, particles, uh, very small particles with very small sensors of them can be scattered into places or rooms or parts of the environment and feed data. So that, in a way, is not a very dramatic number because the expectation is that lots of, art, lots of devices and lots of appliances and lots of parts of the world will have sensors in them and those sensors get counted as connected devices. There, there's an estimate about um, how much spending, uh, particularly American businesses, are going to do on this, $267 billion. That there is a, estimates by General Electric, one of the big American manufacturing firms, that revenues of uh, up to $11.1 trillion will be generated by the Internet of Things in the coming 15 or 20 years. And Cisco says that the home to, connected home and machine-to-machine -machine connections will triple online traffic. So one of the things that is going to happen is that uh, the Internet is going to be stressed by how much data are being collected and how uh, they are going to uh, feed each other and talk to each other and otherwise coordinate their systems with each other. So it's an amazing set of developments. Probably not uh, all of those things will come true, but this just gives you a sense that the expectations are that this is going to be a dramatic part of life in the years to come. Now, when all of these things connect, get connected, Sometimes bad things happen. One of the striking things about the first wave of Internet of Things devices is that they don't have necessarily a lot of security built into them. They don't have privacy protections. They don't have secure socket and other kinds of protections that can prevent bot attacks. So at the uh, end of last year, there was a, uh, an attack on one of the core elements of the Internet. The Internet is sort of, uh, there's an address system in the Internet that if you don't have the address system, things don't work. When you want a particular website, you want to go to that website, and the address system helps you do that. One of the corporations that runs one of the central web, uh, web address elements in the United States was attacked in what was called a denial of service attack. It was essentially uh, a botnet that told all of the connected devices, um, send queries to this one particular set, uh, to this one part of the internet, and overwhelm it. The whole idea was to have so many queries pouring in over such a short amount of time, it was essentially break this part of the address system. And it did. It broke them. And all of the devices that were used as part of the attack were compromised elements of the Internet of Things. My favorite one, uh, favorite actually examples, are baby monitors and light bulbs. You know, there are smart light bulbs that you can plug into sockets now that tell you a lot of things about the light bulb and how it's used. But the light bulbs are sold without security protections, very strikingly put into them. And baby monitors, you know, parents want to listen to their babies in the next room and make sure the baby's sleeping well and make sure the baby's breathing and things. Well, they're also sold without protections in them. And these were compromised by this botnet and then told at this moment, feed a query towards this part of the address system of the internet. And it shut down, at least in the United States, it shut down some of the most major websites 
for hours. Amazon, Netflix, Target, the big department store, PayPal, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Twitter, CNN, Comcast, Verizon, which are American telecommunications companies. Zillow is a uh, real estate site that's very prominent and very important in the American system. And so this whole, by attacking this one part of the internet, by these Internet of Things devices, they shut down part of the internet for a serious amount of time. There was an even worse attack called WannaCry that shut down um, Russian websites, the British medical system, and big parts of uh, the North American internet that was uh, also part of a major botnet. And the attack mechanism was developed by the United States National Security Agency, one of the major intelligence uh, agencies in the United States. The National Security Agency website was compromised all of the ways that they were thinking that the attacks could be mounted against other sites were stolen. And so all of these techniques about how to compromise the internet that were developed by the NSA were then pro promoted on the internet, and one of them was used in shutting down a part of the internet. So the security implications and the privacy implications and just the problems of all of this connectivity can also be exploited by bad folks. So we ask experts, one of the things that we do in addition to the uh, surveys that we do of citizens of the United States as well as a part of our uh, effort is also citizens of other parts of the world, we ask experts sometimes what's going to happen in the future. Because regular people sometimes don't have a really decent sense of that, but people who are in the industry or scholars studying it or people who are building the internet know a lot about where things are heading. And so we've asked about how the Internet of Things is going to roll out. And this is what uh, they told us in a, a piece of work that we did not too long ago. Sort of the big thing that they said was, as the Internet is everywhere, it will become like ele electricity in people's lives. It will be in the background. You won't even think about it when you are online because it will be so many places that the only time you'll notice if the Internet is in your life is when it's not working. Think about today. You walked into this room, right? And you sat down, and you didn't say to yourself, oh, thank goodness we're on electricity, right? There's just assumed to be part of the room. The lights were on. It was a beautiful day. The only th time we'd think that the electricity was part of our lives is if it weren't working, and I, my show couldn't be shown or something like that. Well, the Internet is eventually going to get to be that way, according to these experts. And they had a bunch of positive things to say about the rise of the Internet of Things, and I'll run through some of those themes. The first is that as all of these data are collected, we're going to know a lot more about ourselves. We're going we're to be smarter about how life proceeds because there's going to be a lot more data, and companies and scholars and people who care are going to be able to know a lot more about how societies operate, and we'll be able to deliver new tools that will make life safer and smarter and much more convenient for people. If this stuff works correctly, we will have an easier time moving from point A to point B. We will have an easier time getting the information we want to do our jobs. We will have an easier time being parents. We will have an easier time being children to our aging parents. We will have an easier time um, navigating through stores that we need to go through. So there are lots of ways that at least the vision of the Internet of Things makes life better and safer. You know, one of the big... Um, I'll actually probably get to that on this slide. One of the big hopes for the Internet of Things is that with all of these medical devices that are sometimes so we strap them to us and we get readings about um, what's going on with our body, how well we sleep, what's going on with our blood sugar or things like that, there are ways in which the accumulation of all of these data will help in the healthcare industry. One of the great frustrations of a lot of especially American experts is that of all of the parts of life that the internet has disrupted and changed for the better, healthcare is sort of the least impact. Healthcare and education are really the two areas where there's been less dramatic change than, for instance, there's been in journalism or publishing or book selling or any of the media properties. And so there's now some hope that the Internet of Things might make all of the 
um, the advances of the internet much more useful to the healthcare community when we're reading our own data, sharing our own data, and medical experts can understand uh, our worlds better. You'll also just be more aware of what's going on around you. That was, you know, your memory will improve when you can uh, access lots of information about what's going on in your life or what's going on in members of your family's lives or your work colleagues' lives or things like that. There's also a way that this is going to deeply disrupt business. One of the striking dramatic examples already of the Internet of Things is it's helping in the supply chain of businesses. It, 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 there, there are ways in which things, well, let's take an example of a farm product. There are ways in which now the Internet of Things is telling farmers when to water their fields and when to add fertilizer to their fields because sensors in the soil are telling them what the crops need. There are ways in which that once the crops are collected, they will be put in smart baskets. So you can see when the, the, the fruit was picked, when it was put in the basket, and when it would began its journey through the shipping system. The sensors in those baskets will tell the companies how, where uh, on the trains or the trucks the fruit is that they're expecting at their stores. Once it gets to the stores, they will be able to tell how fresh it is, what farm it's come from, whether farms are compliant with uh, regional laws or national laws. And it will be able to tell the consumer, you know, your piece of fruit came from this farm, traveled this many days, got in your store on this day, and was made available to you on this day. And you can, you, you'll understand a lot more about the products and services that you get. There will also be ways that as we get more connectivity in the world, we're going to have a lot more um, uh, capacity and leverage because we're going to have smart agents operating in our behalf. You'll be able to tell your friendly personal bot, you know, tell me what the weather's going to be on this day or tell me what my meeting list is on this day. Tell me how soon I'm going to have to leave my house to get to the meeting I need to go to. Tell me about the people who are going to be in the meeting and remind me what I'm supposed to prepare for uh, for my presentation at the meeting. So there'll be lots of ways that uh, that uh, we will have agents working on our behalf, and there'll be lots of ways that we interact with each other because we will have these vivid um, encounters that aren't necessarily person to person. We, my hologram will talk to your hologram, and we'll get some business done, and maybe that will make me a much more efficient person, but it also will mean that um, rather than worrying about the internet being um, something that alienates people or removes them from um, life, there will be ways now that we can interact with each other that will seem very real and meaningful. That's what people say about the Internet of Things. And finally, they there's a way in which all of these sensors and all of these products and all of this environmental data that are being fed to us will just mean that we know what's going on in our world. We'll know where climate change is having its greatest effect. We'll know where uh, heat outbreaks are. We'll know where there are floods. We'll know where um, snowfalls are, are smaller than they used to be. There will be lots of ways that we will understand our world um, because we are getting evidence from it, from the Internet of Things. So, sounds like a pretty good vision, right? But these experts also say that's not the only part of the story. A lot of good things have to happen for that vision to be realized, and along the way, there are problems that we potentially will encounter. First relates to privacy. When our phones, when the rooms, when our cars are feeding data about us, guess what? You don't get to be private as much as you used to be. And all of these data are in service of all of these applications that are supposed to make your life better, but you are going to be understood in a much more intimate way when essentially your phone becomes a spy on who you are. And there are lots of concerns that as, as we evolve into this system, that some people will be able essentially to buy their way into privacy but other people won't. Uh, you'll have to be smart. You have to be digitally literate. You have to have the capacity to turn on and off uh, the systems. Uh, and so there are ways in which smart, connected people will be able to take advantage of all these good things without compromising their privacy. But lots of us won't know enough or won't have the capacity to turn off the systems when we don't want them to be spies on us. 
Another thing is that our relationship to machines is going to get different. The nature of work is going to change. There's a lot of concern about the rise of robotics and the rise of artificial intelligence and what that will mean for workers of the future. It's an open question about whether more jobs will be created in the future by these new things or more jobs will be destroyed as machines are able to do many more functions that used to be performed by humans. There's a way in which you know, the bad guys get to win in this environment. There are lots of ways in which uh, I just described these bot attacks, that, but connected networks are, are, are facilitate people being mad with each other. We've seen that uh, in the United States and in Europe and other places where the, all of these data can help people manipulate each other and also can give certain advantages to people that others don't have. And that will create social divisions and, and fissures, according to some of these experts, uh, in a way that will be very destructive to human relations. There's a way in which there is lots of concern that the bad actors in this world can take advantage of these new tools and make people more miserable than they've ever been before. Uh, that one of the arguments that we hear from these experts is that human nature won't change. It's been embedded on us for tens of thousands of years. And it will take a lot to undo it. So all of the ways in which humans are miserable to each other and humans in groups uh, attack others who are in other groups or things like that, or people are vulnerable, these give the bad actors new ways to make other people miserable. And that's a, a, a major concern of the internet. And the final theme is that a standard story of history is that technology runs through a culture, and it takes a while for human ingenuity and human institutions to catch up. And there, there's so much change now occurring, particularly as the Internet of Things becomes a more important part of our lives, that our capacity, both personally and as actors in institutions, won't be able to keep up, and, we, and, and the technology will race ahead of our ability to control it. So if we're really concerned about privacy, it might get to a point where privacy is so deeply compromised that we actually can't recapture or reassert our own way of dealing with privacy. There, if, if it turns out that these tools create bigger socioeconomic crises uh, for folks, that there aren't ways to soften uh, some of the damage that might be done there because we won't sort of um, be able to do it quickly enough to cut off some of the problems. So with all these problems on the horizon, one last question we ask the experts is, um, are these problems so big and the, is the harm so, so great that people will disconnect? Uh, that they, what we now know as highly connected life will actually, will see people uh, moving out of it. So we asked experts uh, this question, do you think some of these problems will be so great that people will disconnect? And almost all the experts say probably not. Because connected life is sort of assumed by the manufacturers. They're making stuff now. It's going to be harder and harder to buy things that aren't connected. And that there are all sorts of other advantages. People, in general, when they face a choice in their life, they like the convenience of these things. They like that they can do things more efficiently than before. They like that a bot might act as their agent in the world. And that is something that matters more to them at the immediate moment than their privacy or the long-term uh, impact of these things. So there's some sense that we're going to keep moving into this connected life no matter what those problems are. And that brings us to the last time, you know, there was a dramatic example of people fighting back were the Luddites in Great Britain who hated that um, looms were taking over the jobs of weavers. And they, there was a movement that started and they smashed some of the looms in those places. And now it's a, it, it's a term, at least in English, that is a uh, dismissive and derisive term. If you're a Luddite, it means you're against progress. You don't like machines. You don't understand the forces of technology. Well, there are some of these experts who say now that these set of issues and concerns related to the Internet of Things might produce another movement where people want to return to a simpler life without technology, even if it means giving up some level of connectivity, even if it means giving up some level of efficiency, even if it means that you have to give up this thing that feels like a body part 
you know, that, that people won't leave home without it, but it might mean that there are some people who will disconnect. It's not entirely clear how big it will be, but there are ways that the forces in these cultures are probably unfolding that we'll see at least some of this uh, in a new form in this age. With that, I will leave you and thank you, and Isabel and I will start a conversation. Thank you very much. Yes, so welcome again, and thank you so much, Mr. Rainey, for this, um, for this presentation. I think we have a lot of issues to discuss. It was very thought-provoking. Um, just to introduce myself again quickly, I work at the Digital Society Institute. That's an institute here at ESMT Berlin. It was founded last year, and we focus on very similar issues in our work. Uh, we focus um, specifically on information security and privacy concerns that arise from the digitalization of our societies and of everything in the Internet of Things. And um, we work together with industry and policymakers also um, to look at solutions to uh, the challenges that are, um, that are arising from these developments. So this is why I'm particularly happy and honored to talk to Mr. Rainey here today about these issues. And I will kick off the discussion with just two or three questions, um, but then quickly open up the floor to all of you so that you can actually um, debate and engage with Mr. Rainey about all these different issues. So, yeah, so Mr. Rainey, you've outlined quite a couple of dire risks that arise from these um, developments in the future and are already present now. If we look at the botnet attacks, um, the Mirai botnet that he explained, for example, it seems like the Internet of Things is also actually um, putting at risk the internet infrastructure and the infrastructure that our entire societies will rely on in the future, basically, and also very much impact us as individuals, as he outlined. So my question to you is, um, what should be done about this? And we can maybe focus on security or um, one of the other aspects that, um, that you outlined, but definitely these risks are systemic. So um, what should be done about this? What should societies do? But who specifically also bears responsibility to act and to prevent or mitigate these risks? Right. First of all, I would, get, I would be fired by the Pew Research Center if I gave my personal opinion on these things. So I will talk about what the experts say uh, right. is part of the solution here. I, I have a colleague here who would report back immediately about <laughs> the felony that I had committed, committed if, I, if I went that direction. I think what a lot of these experts would say is that there's a, there's a variety of ways uh, to, to be thinking about this. First, there's sort of, uh, they talk about personal responsibility. Mm. It's, I mean, you, the creation of your institute is a fabulous example of how businesses and concerned individuals are now beginning to think about these things even before some of the worst stuff has happened. So there's, there's a lot of ways that this is now very embedded in lots of conversations, and especially in the business world, about how, how it unfolds and how we respond to it. But, the, but one of the arguments that these experts make is still it's, it starts with individuals who have to be a bit more aware of what they're signing up for when they get these devices. Partly they need to study it. Partly, they, they, there's a lot of talk in, in America about other new literacies that need to be incorporated in educational programs. So it's not just reading and writing and speaking that these experts say, you know, the standard literacies that matter, but that there are ways in which technological literacy, information literacy, and in some ways, gadget literacy. What are you doing when you're buying a smart light bulb? What are you doing when you ask your bot to get you a quart of milk at the, uh, at the local grocery store? So there are ways in which individuals have to sort of take charge of their lives. There's also the, the big public policy thing, at least in the United States, that lots of experts um, support is this sort of in, introducing this kind of conversation into school programs, particularly at younger levels, so that you know, there's a lot of worry that, uh, that that children are spending too much time on screens. 
And so there, there's a way in which you can talk about that in educational settings, according to these experts. There are ways in which um, they think about the companies themselves. So there's, there's a lot of confusion about privacy. And then you, when you sign up for an app, you know, on your smartphone, you have to usually go to a terms of service button and you agree that you will live by the terms of service. No Americans read those terms of service. They're too long. They're too full of legal language that people don't understand. So you just want the, you just want the app. So you immediately hit the I accept button and all of a sudden your phone becomes a spy on you. So there are ways in which um, these experts think about um, a little bit more clarity, a little more simplicity in, the, in your device sort of saying, by the way, I'm reminding you, I'm capturing information about where you've been. I'm capturing information about what other apps you've used on your smartphone. So there's disclosure and transparency. And at the final level, there are, there's, there's some talk about, um, at, at the larger policy level, about you know, product safety issues, that lots of societies have um, ministries or agencies that review whether consumer products are safe or not. And you can't sell a car that doesn't have brakes on it. You can't sell a baby crib that where the slats are so wide that a baby can get stuck in the, between the slats of the crib. Well, there are, some of these experts talk about a regime of, of product safety and product security that the government... Um, that they wish that the government would monitor. So it's, it's a variety of things. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and so my, my second question relates to, um, you know, you were showing a, a world map and obviously we see that the internet is everywhere and, um, you know, it's, uh, we have a lot of big technology companies, for example, in China that drive this innovation as well. And so my question is whether, for example, in your interviews, expert interviews, but also um, the uh, individuals you asked, um, what are your impressions of how the Internet of Things affects um, people in other regions of the world outside of this um, transatlantic space that we are uh, in here, let's say, um, for example, in China or India, um, these developments uh, might also um, have a different impact on people's lives, also considering the regulation um, around those and the use by governments or companies. So what is your impression of how uh, users experience the Internet of Things maybe differently around the world? It, it, the Internet of Things will definitely uh, proceed through different societies at different speeds and with different impacts. And so one of the most striking things that's happened maybe in the past five years is that lots of countries in some regions like the EU have become much more attentive and much more concerned about the impact, particularly of big American technology companies. And th so there's a special concern that these are American-based companies with sort of American-based cultural inputs and, and things like that. So there are lots of ways that cultures are trying to figure out how much of the original part of these services they want and how much they would like to change and make sure are suitable for their own um, situations and their own cultures. So in a way, many of these experts think that in the next couple of years, you're going to get a balkanization of the internet. You will get a different internet in Germany from the internet you get in China, from the internet you get in India, from the internet you get in Costa Rica. And as cultures begin to assert themselves on this, and as cultures begin to demand that the American technology companies play by their rules. There's just lots of ways now that, that cultures want to make sure that they, that they aren't just accepting the terms of service of, of American technology companies. Mm -hmm. The most dramatic example of that is, of course, where people trying to figure out or countries trying to figure out um, social media policies, right? Because fake news, misinformation, uh, cross-border weaponization of information, recruitment by terrorists, these are all major concerns that are, take place around the world. And even Americans are sort of saying, in a way, um, maybe the technology companies uh, need to have a, some more rules applied to them because the exploits and the vulnerabilities are so great that we just can't let them run their businesses just the way they want to. And, and last week, there were major hearings in the United States Congress about the role of social media companies in relation to the election of 2016. 
And, and so there'll be lots of, um, lots of people at the table at those conversations. And there are lots of ways that countries still have the capacity to influence the policies of these big companies. In a way, um, there's some prospect that what happens in the EU is eventually going to set policy for the world and how the social media companies and the search companies handle privacy and handle security mm. issues. So there are ways that the countries have a lot of, um, of uh, influence over what happens probably. Yeah, thank you. So just um, as a last question, um, building on, uh, on the privacy and security issues, I think um, throughout the last months especially, we've seen more and more concern about artificial intelligence and how algorithms, you know, rule our lives, how they, how code becomes law, let's yeah. say, you know, and um, how uh, all our decisions and interactions with the internet are actually uh, kind of ruled by algorithms that we don't understand or that not, not a lot of people actually understand that right. constantly change and that are also quite intransparent. So, um, I was wondering whether uh, you were um, also talking about this issue with the experts and, um, you know, there's also a discussion, for example, in Europe about regulating um, such developments and imposing accountability and transparency rules on tech companies. Um, was there uh, any kind of concern among the experts about these developments and about how to, and maybe ideas about how to uh, safeguard fairness in society so that you as an individual also can um, you know, regain control over how you are judged by these algorithms. Yes. Um, there's a lot of concern, and it, actually some of the great American technology leaders are at the, the leading edge of that concern. Um, Bill Gates and Elon Musk, the creator of the Tesla car, Stephen Hawking have all warned about runaway artificial intelligence that essentially escapes the capacity of humans to control it. So there's a lot of talk in, in, all over the world about the impacts of this. When the, one of the things that experts point out is that for all of the data that are being collected now, and maybe in the future, there are still limits to it. And there are still cultural biases that are built into it, particularly how the algorithms are organized, because algorithm writers have their own experiences. And even if they um, are not trying to be biased or not trying to discriminate, um, there are ways in which these can push towards unfair or unequal outcomes. One very prominent example in the United States is that the city of Boston it's in the north, so it has a problem with potholes, with just holes in the pavement that during uh, heavy winters, the holes get bigger and it, they ruin cars and they just make life miserable for people who drive in Boston. So the city thought it would be a great thing to use the gyroscopes in smartphones and use the, G the GPS data, the, ge the geographical data, to figure out where the potholes were. So you could download an app that was developed by the city of Boston to put on your smartphone that all you had to do is keep your smartphone on. And it's particularly when you were driving in a car or you were riding in a taxi or something, if the smartphone was on and that app was on, it would say when the car bumped into something or when the car was where it was at the intersection uh, that the pothole was. Great idea, right? It makes municipal services better, it makes the roads better. Well, it turns out that it was first made available on the iPhone, which is used by more upscale people. They can afford to spend more money on the iPhone. It's a little bit more status conscious sometimes in America. And so a lot of iPhone users were reporting where the potholes were. So where were they? They were in the better off neighborhoods. They didn't drive through poorer neighborhoods. They didn't have experience in poorer neighborhoods. So this app that was created for everyone, so there are ways in which, you know, without any intent to do harm, there are, you know, there are sometimes unequal results on this. Yeah. And there's talk about, you know, maybe being much more vigilant about monitoring outcomes especially. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, now I'm going to open up the debate to the audience. And um, yeah, you can just give a sign of hands if you have a, um, a thought or a question for Mr. Rainey. And please introduce yourself um, with name and institutional affiliation. Thank you.
Thank you very much uh, for your uh, statements. And Thank you. Would you agree that uh, we are creating a second universe, a kind of second uh, uh, mankind, like the, the scholar of the, the, the witch uh, uh, who who walks this way? He, he, which is in, which will be, is in his, is in his nature, and, and that the biggest failure, the biggest mistake maker will be the, the, the human being, at least uh, when we have this algorithm uh, universe, this this uh, that uh, uh, second uh, world of mankind, and 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 um, uh, would you agree that we uh, we we as we, we regard history of, of between the worst case and the best case uh, uh, that we we. Uh, um, have immense, immense dangerous. Um, we are walking to to an immense uh, dangerous possi possibilities. I mean, and is able to have, for instance, uh, at one day the DNA of the whole world population, and then we don't need weapons. We can have these B size, uh, small uh, killer drones which kill the DNA of a person they we don't like or uh, kind of Osama bin Laden or something. And mm -hmm. and will it will. Uh, uh, won't be faced that it will, it will stop the whole uh, ideals of liberty of uh, human beings of individuals in the future and 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 we have to, we should uh, uh, find an international international solutions uh, um, uh, for 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 guaranteeing this uh, equal rights for every person on earth so on the other hand we will have a growing uh, world, popula world population which uh, destroys the Amazonas, for instance, to be, have uh, produce more soya for the for a growing uh, mankind, and so, and and yeah, we've asked so we've asked will, questions It will limit like us in in our rights and will limit everything, and so yeah, it, it, yeah stop it, it's so it's a big question. What happens to humanity when all of these machines get so good at at, at what they're doing, and when all of these data are are giving um, input about who we are, including maybe our own genetic data, and so again, sort of what these experts say is that we, there's a good path and a not so good path. And the good path on this is that under the right circumstances, these machine enhancements will make us better at what we are and relieve us of some of the, the unpleasant parts of being a human. So if, it, if machines replace jobs that are very hard jobs or very dangerous jobs and create more jobs that are that are safe and have value, and people who will go to those jobs think that they, they are leading meaningful lives and making a meaningful contribution, great. And if you can drive in a driverless car and not have to worry about the other drivers around you because it's all safe and nobody's going to run into each other, and you've got time to read or make phone calls or watch your favorite YouTube videos or whatever, that's a, may, maybe an improvement too. And then, then the final thing that they talk about is that the man-machine um, connection can sometimes make better human beings, that, that you can be smarter, um, and that, these, uh, that sometimes genetic um, engineering can get rid of some major diseases that have caused nothing but misery for human history. So that's, there's a good side to this greater interface. But if you hand your, the other side of this is if you hand your life over to algorithms, um, when do you get to make choices? You know, are you steered by the algorithms only to certain kinds of information or certain kinds of decisions or certain kinds of parts of town or whatever? Then your human agency, your capacity as a free human to make choices maybe gets narrowed or maybe gets handed off entirely to the machine. There are ways in which, you know, people in the wrong hands, people will use machines to cause all sorts of trouble for people that they don't like. And, and so there's unfairness and there's, um, there's contention and there's sometimes violence um, that comes from that. Uh, and so this is, these, are big, these are big questions. And I, I, my guess is that there will be institutes like yours <laughs> that will um, probably th be thinking through lots of this stuff. And in a way, one of the privileges we have of living now is that we can think we're, we're, we're f ahead of when the worst is, is yet to come. So there's a way in which conversations and policies can be steered towards the best stuff and steered away from the worst stuff. Um, so it's a, it's a, you know, we've got choices to make now. Yeah. Um, hello, David Reinhardt, um, Statutory Health Insurances um, Association. 
And I was wondering, because of my background, you said that one of the biggest hopes is to have better health and health care with the Internet of Things or the um, general developments. So I would really like to know, like, what are the hindering factors right now? Because you said right now we still might have, be able to have a big uh, advance in this area. And maybe a li little bit similar, what are the best and worst cases within healthcare? Because it is a very personal, uh, uh, very, yeah, personal topic for everybody, I guess. Yeah, great, uh, fabulous, wonderful, smart question. Um, the best st stuff that people talk about uh, about this is that all of the imperfect models that the insurance industry now uses to evaluate your insurance eligibility, sometimes your credit eligibility, sometimes your job eligibility, they will get better as we are as as um, as we are better understood. There are ways in which if you can detach someone's personal identity from their health information, you can gather up a whole population's worth of health information and figure out these people are particularly susceptible to disease and early interventions might help or early diagnostics might be particularly well suited to them. Um, there are ways in which you can um, potentially create, well, in the United States, they've actually already passed a law that says that we want genetic information to be um, volunteered to, to public health agencies because we can figure out where diseases come from and who's susceptible, but we don't want to discriminate against the particular individual who has given up their genetic information. So now it's against the law in the United States to use someone's genetic information when making insurance decisions or hiring decisions or credit decisions. There are loopholes. It's not a, you know, there are some people who say it's not a perfect law, but there are ways in which you can sort of um, direct the collectors of data to use it for good and not use it to, in a way that hurts human agency in the way we we're describing. The bad stuff is that as more of these data get collected, there will just be um, lots of analytics applied to them that sometimes won't apply. You, you know, when you have lots of data, you can do correlations. And sometimes people mistake correlations for causation. So if you see people who have uh, you know, certain genetic markers in their life and that's connected to other parts of their life, it might not be that those are related, but the, the analysts will sort of make the mistake of thinking they're related and make policy off those mistakes. There are other ways that, um, that societies that don't have anti-discrimination laws, these these tools can be used to discriminate against them. If, you, if you've got a genetic disposition to get a certain disease or to have a certain mental health problem or something like that, if you're, there, you're not protected, that could come back to hurt you as you're applying for a job or applying for credit or applying for insurance. And so there, there are ways in which this, again, sort of goes in both directions. Uh, and there's a lot of conversation about how to make sure the best is honored and the, and the worst can be sort of worked against. Does that make sense? OK, thanks. <clears throat> I'm von Heinitz, I'm a consultant. <clears throat> Mr. Rainey, I would like to understand um, whether you see in the data you collect from the expert panels a discrepancy with the data of the general public. The background of the question is whether the uh, expert panels are to some extent self-serving in their views of the future development. Um, let me phrase that question in a different way. Um, I was surprised that you said on the, on the dark side that there may be um, a lot of unemployment resulting from uh, advances in digitization. Okay. I haven't heard whether there are clear evidence that there are productivity gains. Recently, we have seen productivity losses, or at least not as big gains advancing in overall productivity. Mm -hmm. And whether the expert panels on those questions are, in principle, more positive than the rest of the general data in the population. Yeah, oh, gosh, really great questions. Um, we don't ask these future of technology questions of the general population yet, so we don't have comparisons. There are some ways, though, that we are beginning 
to, to do the comparisons of the experts and the general population. Um, there are two domains of it. One is that we look at science policy issues, and we talk to scientists and do surveys of them, and then we talk to the general population and do surveys of them. And there are wide discrepancies, mostly for policy preferences, not for predictions, but um, Americans um, are very worried about the health and safety of genetically modified foods, and the experts are not. Americans are a, a bit worried now about vaccines, but the experts are not. Americans are worried about the use of pesticides, but most scientists in our survey were not. And we recently asked about um, driverless cars. And it's sort of a little, uh, not a little, but a, a, one of the elements of the Internet of Things. And mostly Americans start being nervous and wary. I know a lot of Germans start lots of conversations being um, uh, concerned about change and things like that. Americans are very much like that. So they are not happy, as a rule, with the prospect of lots of driverless cars on the road, even if you walk them through, well, some people say these are going to be some of the benefits. Um, that's a, the same thing is true we asked about um, genetic um, um, editing to get rid of babies' diseases. But even with that prospect, even we're going to help babies, um, Americans start being wary of that because they don't, they think a couple of things. They think that the, uh, the gene editing technology will be used before it's deeply evaluated. They worry that even if it's well evaluated and well approved, that there are going to be more um, elements of inequality in American society, that, that rich parents will be able to take care of their babies and poor parents won't, and that's not good. They also worry about uh, the permanent effects of any kind of gene change. It's not necessarily for that one particular child, but if it cascades through the whole um, genomic population, who knows where it will end up. So something that seems good now might not be good in the long run. So that's Americans' uh, starting points on lots of these things. And the, 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 the complication of, of, in these data is that if you ask Americans right now, do you like technology or not, they love it. <laughs> they, they won't give up their smartphones. They love the internet. They know all of the problems. They're worried about distractions. They're worried about what it's doing to our brains. But if you ask them on balance, thinking of all the good stuff and all the bad stuff, is it, is it something you'd like to have or not? the vast majority of Americans are for it. So in a way, they're, as they're thinking about their current lives, they like it a lot, just the same way the experts are sort of thinking that the future might be bright. So I'm uh, Leander Kirschner. I'm part of the <coughs> MIM 2017 class. And my question is, you also talked about the dark side. One perspective of it was that um, we should uh, be aware that uh, there will be more privacy concerns. But um, this is just one part of the technology at the moment. I mean, if we see, like, people don't value data, that's why we give it away for free to yeah. intermediaries, so they give us, a, give us a certain service. But on the other hand, there is also new technologies coming up, like blockchain, for example, where you could, um, without the interme intermediary, act a certain service and then the data would be only exchanged between the two parties involved in a deal. And then at this point, it would be able to have your set of data and then decide which portion of the data you would like to give away to other parties, which would then probably pay a certain price for it, so that then the data would be valued, and this could also, in a certain way, dissolve the problem, don't you think? Yeah. Uh, gosh, <laughs> great, great points all. There are a lot, there's a lot of activity in the technology community, both here and in the United States, that is trying to give back to people some of the control over their own data and to, re to realize some value of some of their own data. So there are tools being built here and in the United States that, you, that eventually you'll be able to either have an app or some um, depository, digital depository, where all of your permissions and all of your data are housed, and you get to decide 
who gets to use it and how they get to use it. And whether even some people might even be able to charge for their data under certain circumstances so they could get real value out of it. So there, there's one set of tools that's moving in that direction. And you made reference to blockchain, which is a lot of people are, blockchain is now at the height of its, of that curve that I was talking about, the height cycle. A lot of people are excited about blockchain, which is an encrypted um, a ledger where interactions between people don't have to be mediated by anyone else. Right now, societies have big institutions that act as trust mechanisms so that people can exchange things. That's essentially what banks are. You know, banks basically say, this person has this much money, that person can get some of that money under the authorization of the first person. Bureaucrats, in many respects, are, are trust agents. You know, you say the government um, keeps birth records, right? And to, in order to get a government ID, you need to go to the right ministry and prove that you are who you are and things like that. There are, people talk now about blockchain as taking a lot of the middle actors and the middle trust institutions out of the equation. I'm dealing with you. You're dealing with me. We register this on a blockchain that can't be edited by anyone, and everybody gets to see what, what happens to my money as it goes through the system, or everybody gets to see what happens in gaming environments. Blockchain is now being used in gaming environments. So there are ways in which people and the technology community is trying to restore some level of balance between the companies and the individual actors. Yeah, and it's, it's, um, it's, uh, it's kind of feels like an arms race. Uh, and it's not, uh, you know, these experts are not yet convinced that blockchain is going to have all the magic in it that, that some of the promoters do. But the other people are saying it's going to be transformative. I mean, the one way to think about blockchain is if you're old enough, like I am, you can remember back to the early 1990s about the enthusiasm for the internet. Sort of, you know, really smart engaged technologists were going crazy. This is going to change everything. And a lot of times they were right. Well, that's how much excitement there is about blockchain now. It's, it's that. It, people are thinking that it's going to um, restore some level of personal exchange related to trust. And we're going to get rid of a lot of uh, sort of waste and friction in the system that exists now. I don't, uh, you know, these experts aren't, aren't convinced quite yet. Or a, a number of them are, but not all of them is the best way to say it. Ms. Rini, I I was wondering if there is any any discussion about how the Internet of it, Internet of Things might affect the diversity of solutions people can come up with, since everybody is connected to the same network that is dishing out the same algorithms and the same solutions for people. How is, is there any sort of thinking about that? Yeah, yeah, there's a lot. And there's a lot of enthusiasm for as more people get access to data. Um, think of open source communities. Now people are talking about open data consortiums and things. And so anybody might be able to access the same data set that experts were able to access. And that you, you do get diversity out of that, or you get people coming at problems and solutions from, from different angles. So there is a lot of, a lot of there were the, in the United States, probably here, there's a really interesting sort of open governance, open data, open government movement. It's, it's mostly geeks. It's not the population. Uh, people don't want, Americans don't want to deal with government when they don't have to. Uh, but there are ways in which you know, th this community says governments collect a lot of data already. And it's hidden in ministries or it's hidden in documentation that's lousy. And if we could only make it available, um, magical things would happen. We would solve any number of problems if we could just figure out what the housing ministry knows about where, what, what the housing problems are in the country and who has mortgages and who doesn't and who has you know, suitable living circumstances and who doesn't. So there, yeah, there's a lot of enthusiasm for the ways in which, kind of the way the open source community and the technology community, now the open data um, community is usually the same people who are saying that um, the crowd can help make a difference here and smart citizens can make a lot of contributions to, um, using their own, you know, their own wisdom, they don't necessarily need a degree or a, or a credential to make a real contribution sharing what they know. Yeah. 
Christian, Christian Daubner, consultant. Uh, a question uh, um, uh, connected to your last point. Is there not a contradiction between uh, the Internet of Things or Internet Everywhere, which you sketched out in your own presentation, and the way in which now you seem to say that uh, we can create quasi islands, uh, blocks, uh, whatever, uh, in which diverse solutions, diverse knowledge is being fed to diverse audiences? Uh, and in which solutions may be different here and there and there. Does not that contradict the logic of uh, your introduction itself? <laughs> um, here, that's a great question, and I'm glad to be pressed on that. To the degree that the Internet of Things starts as a corporate enterprise, um, there's a lot of worry about you know, the power of those corporations over us and our data, the algorithms, and all those things. And, I, and so um, I think there will be sort of different cultural responses to that in different places. And so I, th those tensions, that's what I was describing there. But there are other, there are other ways in which um, uh, you know, it, it, solutions can emerge from this, some of which are technological, some of which are just based on people's smartness uh, and ingenuity. And one of the reasons that we do these surveys of experts now is, um, in a sense, to try to jumpstart the conversation. Uh, some of these issues aren't top of mind for policymakers, even sometimes for technologists. And we're hoping that by just assembling crowdsourcing in a way, um, expert opinion and expert predictions, we can sort of encourage cultural conversation around these issues. Again, Pew doesn't want to dictate what the solutions are, but, but it's the experts have a good enough track record sort of seeing the way technology is going to go that, that talking about how to make it be good and how to make it not be bad um, are, are part of the contribution we make. And I, um, I, I, and I think in a way, a lot of our findings on this and other subjects are that this, that this is a moment when everything's up for grabs. You know, the solutions aren't yet fully in place. The dimensions of the problems aren't yet fully understood. The range of, of solutions and policy aren't even um, being articulated yet. And so um, in 10 years, I'll come back and answer your question. And, and I, I'm willing to believe that you're right, that I'm contradicting myself, that there's, you know, there's only one direction for this stuff and I shouldn't be, um, or I, uh, you know, I need to acknowledge that. But right now, I'm convinced that there's enough sort of commotion on all of these fronts that it's, it's right you know, to say that this stuff is challenging people and, co and potentially causing problems. And it's also right to say that there are, you know, any number of folks who are quite hopeful that solutions might be um, realized. So 10 years, you're going to have me back, right? Is that that's the deal Perfect. we just struck? <laughs> Already <laughs> scheduling it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Ali Khan is I'm with the uh, Turkish Embassy. Um, I, I think uh, despite... Some, some worries, there's overall consensus that uh, everybody wants to move forward with digitalization and Internet of Things. The um, discussion seems to be more on the U.S. centricity of the institutions. Yeah. And, uh, of course, you can, you can debate how international these um, uh, inter Internet giants act actually are. Just uh, today it was uh, in the news that... Um, the major ones have actually very significant uh, Middle Eastern investors' uh, stakes, uh, etc. But you talked about um, balkanization, mm -hmm. and uh, this is evident when you look at Russia and China, you have Baidu and uh, Alibaba and all those. But when you look between uh, EU and US, uh, do you see a balkanization coming? I mean, in, in other words, do you see Europe uh, creating uh, its own champions in the, in the coming future, or, or, or do you see that remaining as a transatlantic block in the digital realm? Yeah, thank you. Gosh, great. That's the hardest question. Um, when I referred to balkanization, I was more thinking about the, what these experts say, which is the American technology companies still dominate, but each 
different country, maybe each different region, gets to customize or tailor the policies that are that Facebook or Google or Twitter have in their um, in their areas. So it's not so much that there will be competitor systems, although there's a, there's some evidence that competitor systems are coming up. A lot of them are American, uh, and so there there are ways in which. Um, uh, the problems connect that people associate with, let's say, Facebook and fake news, and, and Facebook and sort of extremism. Um, there are now technology companies that are on both sides of that um, issue. There are some, some that are coming up that sort of say, Facebook is actually becoming too polite and too much a sort of truth ministry, and we want free speech, and we want it to be as radical and crazy and, and sometimes even hateful as it's meant to be. So that's what our site's going to be about. There are other sites that are coming up at the other end sort of saying Facebook is too hostile and creates too much uh, tension between people. Here's a safe place to be. So it's a real community-based place. There are very particular rules that people can't say certain things to each other or act in certain ways to each other. And so, you know, to the degree that there, are, you know, there's always sort of exploration about market possibilities in this. And I'm, you know, there's a, and so there will be sort of country versions of that. My guess is too. Whether they ever get as big as Facebook or Google, who knows? But um, the other way that balkanization occurs is, e is at the policy level where somebody, the EU or even American policymakers or, or somebody else, basically says, no, these are the new rules of the road. They, they're, they're actually, um, after some privacy issues related to both Google and Facebook, they have... Justice Department people now monitoring some elements of their businesses. And you can see how if that becomes a concern for more kinds of issues, that'll happen too. So I don't know if there will ever be a Turkish, uh, you know, a powerful company like Google or Facebook or something like that, but there will be ways that this, you know, there will always be tests at the edges about, um, you know, different kinds of technology solutions to this thing. The other thing is that the, again, sort of going back to the open source Movement. Um, there, there will be ways that this, um, that, that uh, you know, uh, citizens themselves or just users will come up with their own solutions. GitHub is a is a great example of of how a community is sharing incredible amounts of technology learning and information um, with it. Uh, there's a friend of mine um, has just launched a research initiative um, because there's a um, citizen science movement in the United States around creating essentially an artificial pancreas. Pancreas is what goes wrong in diabetes. It's the one that doesn't produce the insulin in the right way. And there's a woman now, a patient. She's not a physician. She's not a medical researcher. She had diabetes, and it made her miserable. And she's now figured out a way with an app and data and a, and a, and a pump that gives her the insulin when it wants that she's essentially evened out. For all of us, our blood sugar level goes up and down when we eat, right? Um, and for diabetics, it goes way up and way down in much more dangerous ways. She's now got it where she's got, with this artificial pancreas or this, you know, machine-assisted pancreas, she's got her blood sugar almost level. And between the extremes of when you get into trouble, uh, either at too much blood sugar or too little blood sugar. So there are ways in which citizens are going to come up with their own kinds of solutions that won't be businesses, but they will be sort of potentially amazing contributions to the health and well-being of people. Okay, so we have less than 10 minutes left, so we can take one more question, please, and then we'll wrap up, unfortunately, already. Thank you, Marcela Gaibor, consultant. Um, it's with the question uh, related to the big players and the literacy, the new skills that the consumers can um, acquire to understand better their privacy. Um, how do you see the competition matter then, and especially in the U.S., talking about Google and Facebook? And I'm, I'm thinking about um, how can consumers actually, even if they understand and learn how to read the privacy uh, terms and, yeah. and, and services, 
it's clear if they don't accept and tick the box, right. they don't right. get to download the app or do right. anything. So is there really a choice? I don't right. think so. And just yeah. maybe a short uh, view on that would be great. Thank Thanks. you. Uh, that, uh, that's exactly, you, you've sort of um, spelled out what the concerns of the privacy advocates around the world are concerned about. You don't get a choice or you, or you have to know a lot to sort of make choices. One of the things that we've seen in our general population surveys, so not experts, but in our general population surveys, is that privacy is a very complicated subject. And it's very driven by particular circumstances and particular conditions. A lot, most Americans aren't either, yes, I want all privacy, or no, I'll give you everything. I don't care what happens to it because you're giving me great stuff. They, they're between there, and it depends on the circumstances of when they're sharing their data and what they're getting in return for their data. So it's very transactional. It's very much based on people's judgments about what value am I getting out of this in return for giving away my data. I think you're right that uh, the, the, in an element of this that um, makes this an imperfect or imbalanced um, uh, calculation is that a lot of people just don't know what's being collected. A lot of Americans particularly say, first of all, I don't know what's being collected about me, and secondly, I don't know what happens to it after it's collected. And they're, they're particularly worried about what happens after it gets collected because they worry about the profiles that will be built around them, whether those are accurate or not in, in the age of algorithms, whether they are understood well enough or not. And they worry about third parties getting access to the data and having even more robust profiles done on them. And it, it just bothers them. They're really mad. And what, what I don't understand in our data, just to be frank about it, is that even as people are kind of mad and certainly confused and kind of angry about how this all happens, they aren't deeply protesting. You know, we've, we've gone through it all over the world, but particularly in America, all of these amazing data breaches where companies, you know, tens and hundreds of millions of accounts and the personal information on them are exposed. You'd think that would change people's behavior. They'd stop using those accounts, or they'd stop using their credit card, or they'd at least demand some level more of disclosure and transparency by these companies. And they're just, while they say they're angry, they don't actually live their lives as if they care a lot about um, the, the individual transactions or that they you know, want the policy community to address them. And I, it's a mystery in our data. When, I, when we first started doing privacy research around the year 2000, I looked at the data and I said, well, pff, there's going to be a, a reckoning on this, that the moment will come when something bad happens, it will be like an, a, a giant oil spill. It, it'll be a giant data spill, and people will be up in arms about it. It's just f as clear as it could be in the data. And we've been through 15 years of all of these data breaches uh, where you know, people's children's information, people's employment information, people's credit history information, people's identification information, and we just have not seen that, uh, you know, that level of deep reaction. So I don't, I don't, I'm, I stopped predicting that this is going to happen, uh, and I, and I, it's, a, it's still a mystery in the data in a way that you perfectly articulated. Okay. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mr. Rainey. Um, big applause for you. And so we've just heard that in 2027, we'll reconvene yes. and test all these hypotheses. <laughs> <laughs> and until then, we'll make sure to hear a lot from you still. Um, make sure to uh, visit the Pew Research internet site, for example, or read the great reports, follow them on Twitter or Lee Rainey um, uh, directly on Twitter. And thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you so much. It's wonderful. Thank you.